Well, Doug Wilson, uh, I think from talking with you in the past, you may have attended a few vacation Bible school sessions when you were a kid. Am I, I, like, yes, I, I have done so. Yes. You have done so. You plead guilty. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and um, did you ever memorize Psalm 119, 11 as a child? Yeah. So we all probably know the verse and... We applied it to memorizing scripture. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee and so on and so forth. And, and then at some point, hopefully, for me, maybe even in Bible college, you read the context, which mm -hmm. VBS isn't always all that good at, the context thing. That's, that's not always the first thing that's emphasized. And you find out that this is a massively long acrostic poem using every possible word uh, for commandment, ordinance, statute, Precepts. all this stuff. And you discover that, you know, you think about it, wow, that's, um, that, psalmist, that psalmist would only have had a certain amount of God's revelation. Mm -hmm. And it included... Leviticus and Deuteronomy and all sorts of stuff like that. And you discover there's the, the, the psalmist loved a lot of stuff that evangelicals just aren't taught to love. God's right. law. Right. God's law. Was that a similar experience to yours? Uh, yes. I grew up um, evangelical Christians, conservative evangelical Christians, have a deeply ambivalent attitude toward the Old Testament. They they love and revere it in the sense that they don't know what to do with it. The, you know, it's like it's like a picture of their great grandma. You know, I know I'm supposed to honor this, but I don't know where I'm supposed to hang it. <laughs> yeah. Right. So um, she looked a little scary too when you start looking really close. Yeah, the, you know? those old photos can be uh, intimidating. Not, yeah, not unlike awesome. Leviticus, right? <laughs> which, which is the one book that has stopped more people from actually reading through the Bible in a year than than any other book has. Um, but yeah, we have a functional problem in a lot of evangelicalism. Of course, given that recent survey, I'm sure you saw it that said a third of evangelicals agreed to the statement that Jesus is a good teacher, but he wasn't God. I'm not sure the term evangelical has much of a meaning, right. uh, to be very honest with you. But limiting it to actual believers, um, I've often said that the church is canonically challenged, that we have a deutero canon. We really do. We have a secondary level of canonicity mm -hmm. with the Old Testament. And if I was to look at the Old Testament as a whole, I would say that the law— especially when you get into uh, laws specifically in regards to how Israelites are to treat other Israelites and how Israelites are to treat people outside of Israel, issues like that. That's almost tertiary. That's almost a third level uh, canon for right. a lot of evangelicals. And so uh, a number of about five, six years ago or so, I did something that no Reformed Baptist had, I, I can guarantee you, no Reformed Baptist before me had ever done this. Now, given how many weird things you do, like sitting on burning couches and things like that, this is probably going to be really boring for you. Sorry. Um, but I'm still not sitting on a burning couch. With you. But um, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know what's coming up in November, and I'm not going to ask for any inside stuff. Um, but my suggestion for you is if you start getting more into pyrotechnics in the future, CGI, CGI. Okay. Just keep, <laughs> keep those things in mind. They're a whole lot better than the actual flames. They're, or they're yeah, I, we're thinking about burning down a federal building. I hear, I hear, I hear <laughs> well, that's okay now. <laughs> that's okay now. That's, uh, as long as you ha you're protesting something, uh, that'll, that'll work. But, uh, anyway, um, what I did uh, as a Reformed Baptist is I played in a Sunday morning service. Now, I'm not even sure you would do this, but I played in a Sunday morning service, the clip, just the audio, but the audio from the West Wing episode when the president rips into someone on the subject of homosexuality 
by doing the, well, you know, the shellfish thing, can the Washington Redskins play football because they're touching a dead pig skin? And you've, you've heard it, I'm sure, a thousand times before. I actually played that during the service as a part of my explanation as to why we were going to spend what ended up being 38 sermons on the subject of the holiness code, uh, the law of God, its application today, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that, like I said, caught their attention. Uh, have right. you ever done anything like that? Would you, would you have ever? No, did, did I don't think it. A Wilsonian line there? No, you, you outdid me there. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I've got. I've got some. I've got to have something uh, that I, that I can say because I'm not sitting on a burning couch. Someone would have uh, to explain to me what the West Wing television show was. Then really? someone would have to explain to me how to how to make something electronic play in the pulpit. You know, there'd be all there'd be all kinds of problems. <laughs> <laughs> Are you saying you've never seen that clip? Um, I think I may have seen the clip, but okay. I've never seen the show. Oh no, no, I hadn't either. Yeah. I, I had never seen an entire. But it just becomes so popular, and you, you certainly you know this because I you were prepared for all of this when you went to the university. Uh, the argumentation of you're picking and choosing. Uh, if you're quoting from Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, then you need to be talking about shellfish and mixed fibers and all that stuff mm -hmm. uh, was extremely big uh, as homosexuality was making its run toward a Burgerfell, basically. Right. And so they had us over a barrel because most of our people don't read the holiness code, have not thought through the holiness code, don't recognize Jesus quotes from the smack dab middle of the holiness code, which is where love your neighbor as yourself is. Um, and as a result, a lot of our people are intimidated when they are accused of picking and choosing regarding God's law. Right. And so, you, you probably know, I wrote, I co-authored a book in 2001 called The Same Sex Controversy with yeah. Jeff Neal. You know Jeff Neal. Yeah, good book. Uh, yeah, and uh, so we had had to deal with these things and struggle with these things and come up with a consistent response to these things uh, years and years ago in dealing with, with homosexuality. So I've had that challenge, and you've obviously engaged that challenge as well, mm -hmm. but it's not going away. No. And now that we're dealing with all sorts of other issues like transgenderism and things like that, having a solid grasp on the centrality of God's law that goes beyond we're not under law, we're under grace. Right, right. Means absolutely vital today. But I'm not hearing nearly as much emphasis upon it as I would expect to hear. Yeah, uh, we threw right on the verge of battle. We threw the majority of our arsenal away. We jettisoned, you know, we jettisoned it. We got rid of it. And then now beleaguered as we are, fighting with, you know, wooden swords and trash can lids. <laughs> we, yeah. and, and, and to their credit, a number of good evangelical folks are still fighting. But they, uh, in, in Timothy, where it says that the man of God, that's um, uh, a... a a statement, a phrase that refers to the minister, that the man of God in the Old Testament is the prophet or the minister, or the uh, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Well, the all Scripture is is the breath of God. Well, what Scripture is he talking about there, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Timothy didn't have a complete edition of the New Testament. He had certainly by by that time he had portions, but he didn't have the whole thing. And the scripture that Paul's referring to is the Old Testament scripture. Uh, Genesis to Malachi for us, Genesis to Second Chronicles for the, uh, for the Jews. Uh, the whole thing is, is profitable for training, teaching, reproof, instruction. And these are times when we need to reprove people, we need to instruct people, we need to teach people. And we've thrown away most of the toolbox we've, or, or thrown away most of our weapons before we before we've gone into battle, and that explains why we're not doing so hot. Most definitely, and at the same time, because of the theological education that most ministers receive in most seminaries, looking at New Testament texts like reading Paul's Epistle to the Corinthians, and being sensitive to his utilization of the Old Testament law, 
um, being sensitive to when he writes to Timothy and how he um, follows the, the commandments in order when laying out the goodness of the law um, in rebuking those who were disputing about genealogies and, and, and all the rest of this kind of stuff. And interestingly enough, when he does so, uh, he includes homosexuality in the sexual sin portion and right. sort of expands that out and, and includes that, which is vitally, I mean, this is vitally important because the homosexual lobby and the quote unquote Christian homosexual movement comes at our people and they come at them in such a way as to separate each of the primary texts out of the narrative of scripture and then pick them off one by one, give them a plausible reason why each of these quote unquote clobber passages are not actually relevant. Right. And our people are left going, well, I, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do about this mm -hmm. because they don't have a holistic understanding of how the apostles viewed the moral content of the law and issues like that. Because let's face it, evangelicalism has pretty much diminished the role of the law. And even amongst reformed folks, we have disagreements. Mm -hmm. uh, we have arguments with one another. And in fact, anyone who would dare to say that God's law remains relevant today might be called the T word. <laughs> and ever since that one book came out from Westminster in the 1980s, you don't want to be called the T word because right. that's pretty, that's almost being bad as being called a Wilsonite. So, right. you know, and that's the end of your, your big conference career at that point. Right. And one of the re there are good hearted Christians who are more than happy to stand by the passages in the Old Testament on, say, homosexuality. But the, they're not embarrassed by that part. What they're embarrassed by is what to say when you, they encounter a, a, an erudite nonbeliever who's got follow up questions. They don't know what to do with the shellfish question. They don't know what to do with stoning the rebellious young uh, delinquent. They don't, they don't know what to do with those passages. And because they don't um, have an answer ready to hand, because they've not been taught, they've not been, um, nobody's gone through this with them and, and answered the obvious questions, they are, they, they'd rather not open up that can of worms. So if I appeal to Leviticus, I'll just stay, stick with Romans 1, because if I go to, Le, if I go to Leviticus, then people are going to say, well, God said other things to Moses. And how do I how do I answer that? Because I eat bacon, I uh, how how do I uh, how do I resolve this? Because it, it can be made in two two minutes by a, a sophisticated non-believer to look like we're picking and choosing, right? Right. So uh, well, I'm appealing to the Old Testament passages that reaffirm my bigotry and homophobia, um, and I don't appeal to uh, anything that would interfere with my breakfast. <laughs> I like the way you put things. So, um, so let's, let's go ahead and, and, and put the big question on the table real quick, deal with it. And so we can get into, I think more important stuff. Um, talk to us about how you view the term theonomy mm -hmm. and how you would view your position in regards to, for example, the Westminster Confession, where it fits historically right. as to how you view the law of God and its role uh, in the church today. Okay, so when people ask me, as they have periodically over the years, are you a theonomist? My first tongue-in-cheek answer is, oh, oh no, I hate God's law. <laughs> Uh, and they said, well, wait, no, you know what I mean. And, th and then you would say, well, no, actually, I don't know what you mean. You, you know, if, if, you're, if you're asking me if I want to line homosexuals up in the city square and execute them with a firing squad, uh, if, if, if that's what you're asking uh, me about, then you've got a caricature of this whole thing running. And I'm not going to say yes in response to your posing the question that way. But if, if we're talking to people who've read a book, people who, have, who are really want to know, honestly want to know, I describe myself as a general equity theonomist or a Westminster theonomist. So um, the Westminster Confession, 
says that the law it breaks the law out into moral, ceremonial, and judicial. The moral law is binding always, always and everywhere. The ceremonial law is fulfilled in Christ, but fulfilled doesn't mean it went away. Fulfilled means it it's um, crucified and raised in Christ. So Paul says we keep the festival not by getting rid of yeast, but by getting rid of the yeast of malice and wickedness. So Christians still keep Passover, but we keep it in a different way. It's fulfilled in Christ. It's so we don't offer the blood of bulls and goats because we trust in the blood of Christ. We, you know, that's the ceremonial law is fulfilled, uh, and then the 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 bear is the judicial law, uh, which the Westminster Confession says was written for that people under those circumstances at that time, and has passed away with the passing away of that nation, except as the general equity thereof may require. Okay, so when I'm looking at the judicial law, I'm looking at, you know, something, the the law I use to illustrate it is the law that requires a parapet around the roof of the house. Right, right. Okay, so... Uh, Back in the Middle East, in those in those times, that's where you went up in the evening to cool off. You'd ah. go up on the roof of the house, and it was like everybody's second story deck. And so the law required a parapet around the roof of your, the the edge of your house to keep people from falling off. Well, it would be blind theonomic, theonomic absurdity for someone to insist that Christians today must build a a deck rail around the roof of their house where nobody goes ever. Right. Um, because that custom, that style of architecture, that state of Israel, that's all gone now. But there is a general equity uh, uh, principle in, in that. So if, I'm, if I were a judge in a Christian republic, I wouldn't mind, uh, and I wouldn't mind deciding that a, a homeowner was liable because he didn't shovel the ice off of his sidewalk and someone broke their leg by falling because there was a negligence there. And I would say the general equity is that a homeowner is responsible for the, uh, to, to, um, he's, he's responsible for the safety of his visitors and it's a general equity principle. So if, if somebody, or to make it a simpler, uh, uh, straight line across, if you didn't have a uh, railing around your second story deck, Right. Um, and someone falls off the second story deck. Is that an actionable item? I think it is because of general equity. So I would appeal to that law and saying the general equity says that you're responsible for the safety of the people there. But, Doug, I, I live in Phoenix. So I'm, I'm, I got to ask you, why would I throw ice on my sidewalk? <laughs> It would immediately turn to steam. I think you have, if you have a couple of more couple more weeks of heat, you're going to be begging us to ship some ice down there. <laughs> you're, you're not going to ask, after a little more of what you're getting, you're not going to ask that question anymore. <laughs> oh, let me tell you something. Uh, yeah, I just, I'm sorry that, that your, your illustration just didn't work for us here. Uh, because as soon as you put the, the moisture on the sidewalk, it's gone. You, you, uh, heard, you heard it here. James White appealing to felt needs. That's, that's not that's not our felt need. <laughs> Believe me, we're both wearing our sweater vests, and I'm dying. Okay, I mean, I, I'm I'm about ready to put a, a sweatband on uh, just simply to <laughs> just simply to survive this uh, thing here. But I'm I'm all for tradition. Anyways, now obviously the parapet example is a great example. The idea is, and this is what I presented in the 38 series uh, sermon series that I did. And that is that uh, we need to look at if we can, if we can, and this is, this is where there are differences of opinion. This is mm -hmm. where there are arguments amongst reformed people. I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I think Greg Bonson specifically said there's still a lot more work to be done in this area as far as fleshing out the applications as they, how they work in, yeah. in, uh, in the world today. Um, but the, the point is that our desire should be to be looking at these texts to recognize that they are just as Theanustas, just as inspired as everything else is. Yeah. And asking the question, <clears throat> if the apostles could so quickly and easily make reference to God's law as a given representative of what his nature is and yeah. make application 
to what was going on in the church. Why, ha- why are we so lazy in even giving consideration to these things and asking, what's the real intention here? What, what was the, the general equity? Because that's, that's obviously where the rubber meets the road is, well, what is that general equity? What is that application? Aside from, there's some laws where you go, okay, is that ceremonial? Is that judicial? Is it partaking of both? Where's the line? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of places where probably you and I might look at the same text and go and draw the line a different place, but at least we're both going, this is still inspired revelation and needs to be honored in that way, right. rather than just simply, hey, that's all gone. We're not in a law under grace. Yeah. If, the, the thing that you, you just quoted, uh, Romans 6, 14, um, that, that verse says uh, in, in its entirety, for sin shall not be your master, for you're not under law, but under grace. And people think that the transition from the Old Testament to the New Testament was a, a matter of God going slack or God lightening up or God becoming less holy or less, cons- you know, that law thing didn't work very much and I'm not going to scold them anymore. I'm going to do it by grace now. Um, and that's just a total misrepresentation of all of Scripture because uh, the the advent of grace in Christ does not change the definition of righteousness. It does not change what holiness looks like. It, what it does is equips us to meet that standard. It doesn't, it doesn't abrogate the standard. It doesn't make the standard go away. So for, in Paul's language, being under law did not mean you had to keep the law. Being under law meant you had to keep the law and couldn't and were therefore under condemnation. So the person who's under law is condemned, not because they keep the law, but because they can't keep the law. So what grace does is it liberates us. It crucifies us uh, with Christ, and we're buried and raised to new life with him, in him. And that's why sin, defined the same way, according to the law of God, shall not be your master. Sin is not your master because you're not under law. You're under, under grace. And the thing that astonishes me in Romans 13, for example, Paul, um, when people say, why do you have such a high view of God's law? I'd say, because God is love. Right? God is love. L- love does no harm to its neighbor, Paul says. L- love is the fulfillment of the law. Every command and whatever, other, and he lists a bunch of them, and whatever com- other commandment there may be, <laughs> including in Leviticus, whatever other commandment there may be are all summed up in this. Love your neighbor as yourself. So what the law of God does is it teaches me what love looks like. I, you know, I know I'm supposed to love my neighbor. I, I, know, I know I have a duty to love my neighbor. But if I borrow his lawnmower and it blows up while I'm using it, what does love look like? Right? I would say if it blows up while I'm using it, I owe him a lawnmower. If I rented it from him, I don't owe him a lawnmower because the— Contingency of it blowing up was included in the rental price, as the Old Testament law teaches. So the, the Bible teaches me what love looks like, and then if I want, or if he wants, I can go beyond that, seeking to love him more and more, and offer to pay for the lawnmower even if I don't owe it, and he can offer to let it go even if I do. You know, we can try to outdo one another in showing love to one another. But the law of God is a reflection of God's character— and God is love. So the people who pit the law and love against one another are showing that they don't understand law and they don't understand love. Right. right. Well, I'm confused, though. Where, where is the option of us both suing the local university for white supremacy for the lawnmower <laughs> blowing up? Yeah, that's, a, that, that's true. And, I, and I, I just made another cultural gap also. I, you don't have lawns down there either. Not, <laughs> not only... Not only no, do you not. No, 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 no. We do have people who move down from Idaho and they plant those and then they, they pretty much wipe out our entire water supply during the summer trying to keep it green, yeah. which is, of course, uh, pretty much impossible. So, uh, yeah, no, we, we do have lawns, just only people who've lived here for like three or four years. Then they give up and and, act and, and bring uh, in the gravel. Bring in the gravel, man. That's exactly <laughs> right. That's, that's, how, that's how it works. That's. I did the exact same thing, but anyways, obviously we have we have agreement on 
on that in regards to this concept of general equity. But that's, of course, where a lot of the, con the conflict ends up coming in within reform circles mm -hmm. is making application and the cultural aspects. Because down through history, there has been uh, there have been Christians who've made applications to the understandings they had of the world at that time and connected that to God's law in a way that we can look at that and go, um, that was a tenuous reading of the text. That's really maybe not what was being intended and things like that. So we, we may look almost wishy-washy when in point of fact, what we're trying to do is we want to make sure we're exegeting those texts properly. So right. we have their proper background because there have been times that even great theologians like Augustine would uh, attribute backgrounds and meanings to texts that just are indefensible. Sure. And yet their opinions become overblown in importance and create an entire tradition. Right. Uh, we're really trying to apply Tota Scriptura and Sola Scriptura uh, in this instance to adequately and properly understand what those New right. Testament laws are about. That's why I spent three weeks in that series doing something again that was, I wasn't trying to win any popularity contest, but I really wanted our people to understand what was going on. I spent two or three weeks going over the gods of the Canaanites, Assyrians, any, anything that would have a direct impact right. in light of the deep apologetic content that is found in the holiness code uh, that whole that whole introduction in in chapter 18 where you uh, have the land spewing the inhabitants out because of the things that they had they had done uh, there's a lot to that that, mm -hmm. that that speaks of the supremacy of Yahweh over the gods of the peoples that we miss because we don't know anything about the the Baals and things like that I I went to Israel, uh, thankfully, for briefly at least in 2018, and I saw one of the uh, one of the high altars, uh, and they they had sort of put a a framework up so you could see how big this thing was there in Israel uh, to the to the Baals and to the Asherah and things like that, and it was like wow that was that was really impressive. You can see why there was the conflict you know, going on. We don't have that background. And so we miss a lot of that right. and miss a lot of the good application that comes from that. Right. But the point being that when we allow the Old Testament text to speak for itself and put it in its proper context, it's amazing the, the depth of, of meaning that comes out of it. But for a lot of people, it's just because they don't have that background. They just don't, don't see why it's relevant for them in their life today. Yeah. Uh, so they dismiss it. So one of the things I'm fond of saying is that Christians should resolve to, once the careful exegesis is done, they should have no problem passages. And so you, so you don't apologize for anything in the Bible once the careful exegesis is done. Once you've satisfied yourself that you've understood the Word of God, and you've also understood that there are places that are difficult to understand. Peter says that about Paul's letters. There's some things that are difficult to understand. And he says that ignorant and unstable people twist them to their own destruction. They, they, you can twist Scripture, so we have to be careful with Scripture. And we can't just say the Bible's the Word of God and then just read a passage in the Old Testament once and then wing off and start issuing decrees to people on the basis of our one-time cursory breeze-through. Right? You, you simply can't do that. And there are places where—and uh, so, of course, liberals take advantage of this— need for careful study, and they want to turn it into a world of nuance where you never land anywhere, right? Uh, right? But Chesterton once said that an open mind is like an open mouth. It's meant to close on something. It's intended mm -hmm. to close on something. And so you come to the text with an open mind, prepared to study, work it all through, and when you've worked it through and you know what God has revealed, at that point, you don't back down. I call it Tom Petty Presbyterianism. <laughs> we don't, you don't back down. You you lay hold of it, and but uh, but until that point, you want to listen to all the arguments. You want to read what different people have to say. You want to study it out. A, a good example of this would be the the marriage passage in Deuteronomy twenty four. All right. So when a man uh, 
puts his wife away for uncleanness that he's found in her. And then, uh, and then he, uh, then she marries again. And then the second husband divorces her and just says divorces her or he dies. Then it prohibits a marriage, her remarrying her first husband. Okay. Now it'd be real easy to say, oh, that, that prohibits uh, any remarriage to your first spouse if there's been an interme- uh, intervening marriage. And, and, I, and that, that m- may well be the meaning of it once we've done the study. But there are some anomalies in that text that, that make me want to go, wait, let's, let's, uh, before we excommunicate anybody for having done that, let's make sure we've done our, our spade work. Uh, the first husband divorces her for uncleanness he's found in her. He, he divorces her for cause, which means he doesn't forfeit the dowry. He doesn't, you know, she's put away for cause, and he is financially advantaged. Then she marries again, and her husband dies, or he just puts her away. Well, if that happens, the first it's possible that husband number one is not allowed to marry her again for financial benefit when he, he said she was unclean and put her away, and then changed his mind once it became uh, financially advantageous for him to do it. There, so there are reasons given for the divorces. You know, there's a reason given in the first one and no reason given in the second one. And and I want to say, well, this is case law. Let's be careful and work it work it all out before we just say uh, every remarriage to an original spouse is banned forever and ever. That might be, but let's you know, there are a lot of details here. Right. And in fact, there's many things in the law that would have resulted actually in the execution right. of a spouse, which right. would have provided de facto divorces right. that don't even figure into, normally don't even figure into people talking about these, these types of issues, apostasy and things like that. I, I, I want to make sure, and you're, I'm, I'm not, we're not quite the same age, but I'm, we're both past that age where you think of something really important and then you get done with the entire interview and remember you forgot to say it and then you feel really stupid. So I'll make sure to go ahead and mention this now. Before okay. I forget okay. It. Get it out but there. It was, it was one of the things that I, I wanted to make sure to mention. Um, back in 2013, I started going down to South Africa and doing ministry down there in South Africa. And I don't know if you've ever seen, um, one of the most popular Muslim speakers in the world, a man by the name of Ahmed Didat. Uh, he died, I think, 2012, actually. May have been two, no, 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 2005, 2005. He died in 2005. I never got a chance to, to debate him. Um, but he's probably been heard by more Muslims than any other Muslim in the world. His videos are still incredibly popular, not only online, but on something that you and I remember called VHS, uh, <laughs> something... Yeah. A lot of young people do not understand today. But anyway, um, so there's a strong Muslim community in South Africa that likes to do debates. And so in, I believe it was September, October of 2013, we got to do a debate in the Abu Bakr Siddiq Mosque in Erasmus, South Africa. And instead of just doing it in a room associated with the mosque or a building near the mosque, we did it in the mosque. I stood in front of the Qibla where the imam stands to lead the prayers. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the Muslims sat on the ground, the Christians sat in chairs because they're wimps. And because um, uh, the Muslims are used to being sitting in that position for hours on end. And the subject of the debate allowed me to really focus upon what the reason for the need of substitutionary atonement was, the need for the imputed righteousness of Christ. And you got to realize, Doug, they're, they're sitting literally no more than 10 feet away from me. I mean, this is a rather intimate yeah. context. So you can look him right in the eye. And one of the strong points that I made that I think resonated with those Muslims in that room was that in Islam, Allah can simply forgive a sin without there being any payment for the, for the broken law. Right. So there's a real popular uh, saying, and that saying, it's called a hadith amongst the Muslims about a man who killed 99 people. And he went to a priest and asked if his repentance would be accepted. 
And the priest said no. And so he killed the priest. And so then he went to a scholar and asked the scholar, and I don't know if the scholar knew about the priest or not. The text doesn't say, but he said, if you go to such and such a city and inquire of them, they will tell you how your repentance can be uh, accepted. Well, as he's going, the time for his death comes because in Islam, it's written on your forehead at your birth. And Allah decrees that if he's one cubit closer to the city he was going to than the city he was coming from, he would go to paradise. And then in some versions of the story, he makes the earth shrink between the man's body and the city. So he's one cubit closer. And so the man goes to paradise, even though he's a mass murderer, he's killed a hundred people and was only going to find out about repentance. Right. And the Muslims tell this story as an illustration of the grace of Allah. See how gracious Allah was to forgive this man. Well, I re-narrated that hadith in the debate. And I said, here's the problem. In Christianity, the law of God is intimately connected with who he is. It's not just something he decides to put together over here and I'm going to put it in this form. Yeah. It represents his holy character. It represents who he is. And that's why there has to be atonement for the breaking of that law, because it's an assault upon his very character. Right. And so in your system, God's law can just simply remain broken. And there's no problem. There, there's, there's, you don't have any problem with that. But in the New Testament, we understand that's not a possibility. Right. That simply can't happen. And th that's because in, the, um, in, the, in Scripture, in, in the Christian faith, God reveals himself. God gives himself. In Islam, God reveals his will. Right. Right. So God tells you what to do. You don't know what God's thinking. You don't know how God actually feels about this. He, he reveals his will, and you do it, or you get squashed like a bug. And his, his will, basically, what they're pointing to as the grace of Allah is actually the capriciousness of Allah, right? So he, yeah. can, he can turn on a dime. He can change his mind. His will is sovereign. And Muslim means the one who submits, basically, one who submits to the will of Allah. Um, when in the Christian faith, we are being sought by a person. When we surrender and repent, we're giving ourselves to a person, and that person is eternal and unchanging, and this is simply the way he is. And, and so consequently, his holiness is not negotiable. It's not up for grabs. God can do anything that's consistent with his own nature and character. But, but, his, but the law is an expression of that nature and character. Right. And the, the problem is, from their perspective, that law, as you said, is capricious. It's arbitrary. Um, it's not necessarily intimately reflective of who Allah is. And therefore, to break it and to leave it broken for all of eternity isn't really even considered within the, the scope of at least the Quran. That obviously becomes an issue in later Islamic theology. But uh, given that they had already rejected New Testament revelation, or to be perfectly honest with you, the author of the Quran didn't know what New Testament revelation contained, uh, they don't have that, they don't have a mediator, they don't have any mechanism of having atonement uh, within their system, which interestingly enough, I'm not sure if you've ever studied a lot of these things, but that, that's part of what gave rise to Shiism. Uh, the Shiite movement has an atonement in it because of the death of its founder. Mm -hmm. And so it's, a, it's, it's interesting that there are ways to get the, the atonement into a discussion with the Shiite that you don't have with the Sunni. Um, but that's a, that's a whole, whole different issue. But the point of law and the, the consistency of law with grace in a full-orbed Christian understanding, but many Christians don't have that full-orbed understanding to be able to present it in the first place. Right. So there's one of the problems with a lot of people who we send over to try to deal with other systems and other religions if we don't have a full-orbed understanding of what our own faith is talking about. Yeah, and a, a, many years ago, I, I this is something I learned from my dad. I asked him, uh, "Does the Old Testament apply, unless the New Testament says it doesn't, or does the Old Testament only apply 
if the New Testament says it does. So, for a lot of Christians, the Old Testament is sort of like the Word of God emeritus, or the, the, word, of, the word of God is semi-retired, you know, he's sitting on the porch in his rocking chair, and then the New Testament will take it from here. So, if the New Testament reiterates something, like you shall not steal, or reiterates you shall not murder, which it does, then that has a continuing obligation. But we, if there's something that's only addressed in the Old Testament, and and we don't have anything in the New Testament on it, you know, bestiality or, you know, something like that, or uh, cross-dressing in Deuteronomy 25 or, the, you know, if some issues, then somebody's going to say, well, the New Testament didn't reiterate that. So consequently, we're not under law, we're under grace. That That would go back to the previous confusion we addressed. But I would prefer to say the Old Testament applies unless the New Testament expressly abrogates it. So if we don't offer up the blood of bulls and goats because Christ died for our sins, uh, those uh, sacrificial laws are fulfilled in Christ, and the book of Hebrews tells us that they are fulfilled and done away. That whole apparatus is done, okay? Um, But everything that's not addressed that way is part of my instruction book on, on how to love other people. Right. So let's do some application here uh, as we look toward wrapping up. Um, Obviously, many Christians today, well, all Christians today, if you're going to have any conversation at all with people in the world, you're going to be addressing Old Testament law application issues. Right. Um, For example, uh, the the Hebrew term um, confusion is directly applicable to what we're seeing take place in regards to transgenderism, the whole insanity of uh, the the poor boy in Texas whose dad is being forced to pay money to have him, in essence, neutered, the poor girl in Canada whose Mm -hmm. dad is in risk of going to jail uh, because he doesn't use... Uh, the proper pronouns for her, right. this kind of stuff, these are, this is confusion. This is a, a violation of the categories of creation that God has given to us. Yes. And it's a, these, but, but these foundational realities are assumed by the New Testament writers. They, are, they don't give any indication that they are under some necessity to repeat all of these things for it to be a given that that's how we are to believe. Right. So the only way to give a full orbed response to the world today concerning the issue, for example, of of human sexuality and gender and everything else is to start with the God who made all of these things. Yeah. And where is that narrative? I mean, the old Testament does say that. I mean, Jesus says it in Matthew chapter 19, but He's quoting from the Old Testament. Right. He's, he's providing a divine inspired interpretation from Genesis. Right. Uh, that's the only place we can go. Yeah. And and then we start to see all the um, delayed time bombs that were planted over the last century. So when we go back to Genesis 1, male and female created he them in the image of God, he created them. Then we say, oh, wait, a big chunk of the church is in thrall to Darwinism. Yeah. And we've been applying monkey business to Genesis 1 and 2 for, for a long time. And now when we want to go, go there for something fundamental, like mm-hmm. uh, mankind created in the image of God, male and female, that's how God represents his image. And so this whole ch- transgender confusion is an assault on the image of God, right? You know, um, God is in his heaven and rebellious man can't reach him. So when the peasants in the valley can't get to the king on the cast and the king on the hill in the castle, what do they do? Well, they burn his image in effigy down in the village. They can do that. They can't get the king in his castle, but they can burn his effigy. They can strike at his image, and that's what this whole transsexual, transgender movement is: burning God's image in effigy. We're trying to get rid. We're trying to scratch it out. Trying to get rid of it, and uh, it's not going to work. The 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 tragedy of it is not going to work. You're going to mar it further. But we bear the image of God, this side of judgment, like it or, you know, 
like it or not. After the fall, um, in Genesis 9, when capital punishment is required for someone who kills a man, it's because man is made in the image of God. That's the reason that's given. So the fall, and Christ came to restore the image of God in us, which means that the image was defaced and marred, but not eradicated. Right. right? And so Christ is restoring it, and even though it's broken and marred, we must still respect it. Well, Darwinism and secularism and all the hermeneutical um, monkey shines that people have been applying to Scripture have been knocking weapons out of our hands, and, we, and we, it finally comes down to it, and we say, okay, we need to, we need to engage, and we look around, and we don't, what, what do we have? Right? Yeah. Um, well, God's, God's people need to be equipped with God's Word. Well, and I'm, we're talking, we're, we're preaching to the choir here, but uh, I think there's something appropriate in people hearing other people encouraging one another and doing the same thing. This is, this is what ministers are supposed to be modeling from the pulpit on a regular basis in properly handling the Word of God. Teaching the whole counsel of God is showing our people this is how you do this. And that's why... That's why when, when we live in a day like today where Christian worldview issues are the first thing they see on their Facebook feed, their email, their RSS feeds, whatever it might be, television, it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, this is not, this is not 1950. Right. I'm not saying there weren't Christian worldview issues that were relevant in 1950. Ignoring them got us into a lot of trouble. But now it's... It's on signs being carried in the streets. Right. And so we should be the first ones who are already raring to go. But that's not normally the case mm -hmm. because so many ministers do not present a Christian worldview. And, and they don't present the, the, the beautiful harmony that exists between all of God's word, between all of God's purposes, his his covenantal actions. And yeah, we can even, you and I will someday, I may have to drive up there to do it, but we will someday even get to debate yeah. on how you make exact applications of all of those things. But the reason you and I can debate this is because we both have the same source of authority. Right. We both have the same commitment that when we hold the scriptures in our hands, we're holding God's very word. It's consistent with itself. You try to hold me to that. I try to hold you to that. That's the only way you can meaningfully have yeah, a Christian debate. Part. A Christian debate can exist because we share the premises. Right. Right. We, we share the premises. And part of the reason why we're not able to debate out in the culture anymore, it's not it's just shoving. It's not debating. You know, it's sumo wrestling because <laughs> there's no. <laughs> There's no shared premise. Um, Sumo wrestling. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So, you, you know, I'm not the only one who wonders exactly what goes on in your mind, Doug. Uh, you, know, we're, we're, you come up with analogies that, um, that make all of us go, huh, I never would have thought of that. <laughs> P.G. Woodhouse once said that some minds are like the soup in a bad restaurant, better left unstirred. <laughs> yeah yeah I, I i i get that okay so a lot of people are going to watch this video i'm not sure what we're titling it right but a lot of people are going to watch this video and they've they've got questions about they, they've heard bad things about that term theonomy and you called yourself right. a general equity theonomist um, we know that theonomy means God's law, the rulership of God's law, over against autonomy, self-rule. Right. Would you agree that there is at least a germ of truth in, or where would you draw the line for those who would say, those are really the only two choices you have, is either God defining the namas or mankind defining the nama. No, I, I, I would agree with that. I would embrace that. So I would okay. say, ultimately, at the meta level, it's either God's law or man's law. It's either God's word or man's word at the meta level. Um, after that, once we, every Christian in the room is going to say, yeah, whatever God wants us to do, we should be doing that. 
Right. Right. So that means that we're all, in a generic sense, theonomists. We, um, after that, the debate is exegetical. So what does God's law, in fact, require us to do? Every Christian believes that we should do what God wants, and God expresses his will and his word, and, and so we should obey that. So uh, we all agree on that. And then, then the question is exegetical. Does, God, does God's law, in fact, require us to outlaw um, usury? You know, does God's law require us to not have interest-bearing loan, uh, interest um, uh, bearing accounts at the bank? Does God's law prohibit that? Well, that's an exegetical question, not a theological question. So, so the theological question is, I want to say that every Christian at bottom must be a theonomist. After that, we should debate exegetically what we, you know, we're going to have different camps and different opinions and different denominational distinctives as we seek to apply what we believe God wants us to do, right? Um, and I think that there, as a party, the capital T theonomists, there were things that they proposed that I wasn't, I, I didn't agree with. But I, I, so I would not call myself a party, a card, pick, car, a card carrying party theonomist. But I, I do embrace the ongoing authority of the Old Testament law, as as filtered through the New Testament and applied by the New Testament, and I'm, a, I'm a theonomist in that sense. Let's real quick, go ahead and touch on penology because yeah. that's really, really important. That was an issue I did address in my series as well, because as a Baptist, um, historically, elements of a theonomic understanding were a part of the death sentences for my forefathers. And I'm not talking about the Anabaptists here. I'm talking about Orthodox people. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's very easy to see how a state, once you have a sacral system, right. the state can utilize God's law to its own ends. Correct. Rather than God's law being a limitation upon its power. Right. So, and, so let me just ahead. jump in there. It is quite true that the, the history of the Christian church is filled with people who thought they were doing the will of God who weren't, who, who were doing destructive things in the name of serving Christ. You know, and you could, Spanish Inquisition, you, you know, you could come up with any number of examples of that. Um, that is, in, in Christian ethics and in Christian history, that is a bug, not a feature. When you have autonomy, the abuse of other people is a feature, not a bug. Okay, self-law, self my, my um, uh, reserving to myself the right to define righteousness, the right to define reality, the right to define everything. Uh, it, once you grant, grant autonomy and everything follows, right? Anything follows. If, if, um, if you grant theonomy, then the Grand Inquisitor might come and put you on trial. But a courageous Christian with an open book can say, hey, man, that's not right. <laughs> that, that's not right. There's a, there's a basis for a challenge of abuses of the system. There have been abuses of the system, but I don't think that we should jettison God's word for the sake of man's word when abusing the system is the point of man's word. So um, I, I very much appreciate that, uh, especially the bug and feature thing, though that really wouldn't have communicated anything until somewhere in the 1980s. <laughs> <laughs> no, one, no one understood exactly how that works. But um, real quickly on the penology issue, sure. how, how do you, um, obviously on an, on a, university campus, someone's going to come up to you and say, do you think it is just that God's law said this? Yeah. Uh, obviously, uh, Leviticus 20, homosexuals, stoning. Right. That's, that's the big one. Um, how, do you, how do you deal with that? So the, the, I would do in two steps. I would answer the person and say, first, answer me this. Do you think that it's just that over a million prisoners are incarcerated today in uh, dog kennel cages. Is that just? Well, that's man's law. Right? So 
Don't don't come up to me saying, oh, there might be this negative thing that might happen. There are negative things happening right now on a grand scale, and and you're not and and you're fine with it. You're you're not protesting or you know you're bothering me. Um, so that's the first that's the first thing is look at look at what your your people are doing. Look at what your system, your penitentiary system, is currently doing. Is there a need for prison reform? Uh, look at secular penology. That's that's the first thing. So, uh, and then on conservative in conservative circles, there'll be people who say uh, you should have the death penalty for drug smuggling, and you're and people are worried about the death penalty for homosexuality, and they're not afraid to advocate for the death penalty for drug smuggling. And they, they don't mind the death penalty just so long as no biblical case could be made for it, <laughs> right? Um, so if the, but then if they turn around and say, okay, your point taken, we've got some things to answer. Now, would you answer my question about what do you believe about the Bible teaching about penology and, and punishments and whatnot? Uh, I would say in, in Scripture, you've got corporal punishment beaten with rods. You've got execution. You've got fines. And you've got exile, ban, you know, banishment. Uh, those are the you don't have a penitentiary uh, system. And um, one of the things that would happen if we adopted a biblical approach to these things is that we'd find the first thing we'd find is out of those um, penalties that are assigned, they are maximum uh, penalties, not minimum penalties. So, uh, so for example. Uh, David committed adultery, which was a capital crime. David committed murder, which is a capital crime, but he was not executed. Asa and Jehoshaphat um, conducted reforms where they basically closed all the bathhouses. And, you know, they exiled the Sodomites, Asa and Jehoshaphat both, and are commended for being godly kings, and they executed no one. There's no executions uh, mentioned anywhere. Um, but they were reformers, and they cleaned up the they cleaned up the city. So, uh, I believe that there are circumstances under which someone could receive that penalty. If we brought that penalty across, there would be circumstances where that would be applied. Okay, um, let's say a priest and young boys, right? Someone uh, there are there are certain offenses that that in the modern era get, simply get you transferred to another diocese. And I think in a godly system would be solved with a tall tree and a short rope. <laughs> tall tree and a short rope. But that would require Christian judges. Right. And right. Christian laws and Christian theologians reasoning through the laws uh, and us having the humility to postpone acting on any of these things until we made sure that the exegesis was right. You know, we, we want to do our work carefully. And one of the things that the history of the Christian church shows is that many people have assumed on a cursory reading that they knew exactly what God was requiring. And I think we need to be a lot more careful when it comes to, to issues of coercion, penalties. I think we have to make triple check, quadruple check our exegesis. Well, I was about to say thank you for a, a stimulating conversation, and then everything froze up. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and thank you for that and uh, look forward to the next uh, time we can get together and discuss another important subject. So uh, thank you, Doug, and thank you for watching uh, as we've discussed God's Law today. 